Welcome back to the last day of the first annual symposium of the Water and Development Partnership Program. Over the last two days, we have heard several stories from the field, analysis of institutional environments, inward reflections on unconscious biases and struggles of engaging across social, political, economic, and cultural differences, language barriers, and unequal power dynamics. For those of you who have stayed with us through these sometimes difficult conversations, we thank you all for your time, energy, patience, and willingness to learn and unlearn. We began yesterday with discussing diversity for impact. We heard from three projects in different parts of the world, including India, Morocco, Algeria, Colombia, and Tanzania. The presenters shared experiences of employing different methods in their work shaped by context specificities, partner needs, and their own capabilities, but also informed by their sometimes differing interpretations of diversity and inclusion. In this session, we saw that though diversity and inclusion are increasingly seen as important values in development, the topic remains somewhat controversial and continues to inspire anxiety among water professionals, pointing to the need for more dialogue about the intrinsic value of diversity beyond donor requirements. The second half of the day was about sustainability of impact. This session served to shift our understanding of both sustainability and impacts. Speakers raised questions about whether it is possible to capture and report impacts of projects through time when they lead to multiple spin-offs, new connections, and alliances between different actors who carry forward their efforts outside of the platforms provided by our projects. Today, we will begin with the last theme session of the symposium and arguably the most awaited, FANEL, a panel for sharing failures and learnings. Our wish is to create space to be vulnerable and share difficult stories of the complex problems faced by water professionals. We applaud the speakers of the session beforehand, taking on the difficult task of explicitly discussing failures. In the afternoon, join us for our closing plenary to hear short reflections from rapporteurs of every session. For those of you who have not yet received this program symposium, my colleague Deborah will share a link in the chat where you can download the program. Before we begin, a few points of housekeeping. We encourage you to use the chat freely and interact with each other through the presentations. But if you have a question for the speakers, please leave it in the question and answer feature of Zoom, which you will find at the lower toolbar in, the, in your Zoom screen. Please indicate who your question is for. And panelists, please feel free to type answers to the questions directed at you. At the end of the three presentations, there will be space for discussion and reflection. At this time, if you would like to speak, Please raise your hand so that we can give you permission to unmute your mic. With this, I would like to begin our first session of the day called FANEL by introducing our moderator and rapporteur. The moderator for the session is Professor Mahret Swartave. Mahret is an irrigation engineer and social scientist who joined IHE Delft in 2014 to become its professor of water governance. She studies water allocation policies and practices, focusing on questions of equity and justice. Her research centers around how institutions, technologies, and markets shape water distributions and the different ways to make sense of or legitimize, legitimize these. Using an interdisciplinary approach, she sees water allocations as the outcome of interactions between nature, technology, and society. Thanks for joining us, Mahre. I hope Mahret is here. I'm here. I thought you were also okay. going to. I thought you were yes. also going to. I will now introduce Muna. Yeah, yeah. Muna. Yeah. Um, Muna has uh, very graciously agreed to be rapporteur for our session. Uh, though the program says that it would be Claire for long, unfortunately Claire is not able to join us at this moment. Thank you, Muna. 
Muna is an action researcher with a background in critical political ecology. Her work aims to understand environmental and water governance through decolonial and critical lenses, focusing particularly on Palestine and the occupied Golan Heights. Muna is currently a fellow in environment at the Geography and Environment Department at LSE. She has been the re senior research associate at the Lancaster Environment Center, where she worked on enhancing joint learning on the project Transformations to the Groundwater, to groundwater Sustainability. Thank you, Muna, for joining us. And I will now pass the mic to Mahre. Thank you, uh, Ayn. And I'm so happy to, to be here today with all of you. And a big surprise to find myself here with uh, my respected colleague, Muna. So very happy to do, that, to, to do this together. I love the title of this, this panel. I'd never heard the name. And immediately the title itself, re, uh, to me, provokes many questions. Questions about what it, is, what, what it means for a project to either succeed or fail. And I think the raising of these question, questions pro probably is precisely what this panel is about. And I think as, as one of my colleagues will explain later, if, if we look at, at projects of collaboration as, as centering around joint learning, rather than just about producing certain outcomes of, or impacts, this joint learning, of course, if we see it and in that way, that immediately brings a reappreciation of the importance of cultivating relations and creating communities. Engaging in always situated and embodied relation making them is not just a precondition for producing measurable impact, but itself becomes an important outcome or result of projects. And in the process of creation, creating these relations, what it means for a project to either fail or succeed itself becomes redefined, I think, I think, and it, that itself is part of the process. It's something interesting because it, it, it's not a way that many of us are used to think about projects. It means that we need to give more emphasis to creating and maintaining rapport with partners from other disciplinary or ge geographical backgrounds, but also with specific watery context. But how to account for and measure this? Relation making, community making is not about generalizing and commensurating, but it's first and foremost about respectfully dealing with difference. It's about cultivating the ability to be affected by or touched by the other. Relating comes with, and it's about feelings, passions, emotions of excitement, attraction, joy, frustration, irrita or irritation, shame, fear, anxiety, as we noticed yesterday. And those emotions are not normally giving, given much prominence when talking about reporting or explaining what, what a development is about. And finally, building relations with people in context, it re requires patience and time. It demands, I think, a slowing down, a realization that investing in relations is an ongoing effort beyond pro project time spans. So it's a, I think the, the failure actually, or calling this a fennel, actually is an invitation to think differently about what projects are about and about what they should do. So I'm very much looking forward to listening to the to the different presentations and the first person two persons who will present are uh, Wim du my my esteemed and dear colleagues uh, Wim Doven and Yeltsje Kemering and Yeltsje is the current coordinator of the water development partnership program she is also an interdisciplinary scholar who engages with critical social science theory to understand how injustices become manifest and how they can be challenged in and around water and agriculture. Wim is the previous coordinator of the Water Development Partnership Program when it, when it was still, still called DUPC. He has been working at IHE since 1997 already, for the, so for a long time. He has a background in urban and regional planning 
Anne is Associate Professor in Integrated River Basin Management. He is involved in training and education and in various partnership projects, before mainly in Asia and re more recently in Iraq and in small island development states. So, Wim and Yeltsje, I'm very curious to learn what you have to say and what your reflections are about thinking differently about impact or about failure and impact of the kind of programs and projects that you are co coordinating. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Margreet, for, uh, for a nice introduction. Um, I will first uh, show my PowerPoints. Yeah. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes I mean, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, it's 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 really a pleasure to be part of this uh, panel and, and session. Um, I fully agree with with Margrethe. It's a very um, interesting uh, topic. I I look forward to listening to the to the different presentations and, and experiences of projects. And it's also very nice to to be able to uh, to present some of the reflections of of the program from program level. And um, so I will I will start, and then Yeltsin will take over. Um, yeah, as you can see, the, um, the Water and Development Partnership Program is a program that actually started already in 2008. It's a long-term collaboration with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, we mainly focus on working in partnerships with Global South partners on water and development issues in, in those countries. Um, as you can see from this uh, figure, uh, we started already in 2008, and there were three phases. So the first phase was actually, I think, a very important phase um, uh, to develop a number of partnerships around uh, education training and, and capacity strengthening. Um, and many of the partners uh, we worked with and we started working with in those days are still uh, key partners of, of, um, of the Institute. Um, then I took over a phase um, two, which um, actually focused more on, on societal impact, different strategies, you know, to 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 help achieve societal impact, uh, with a strong focus on local ownership, more user-centered, um, uh, etc. So this was also, um, I think, a, a new kind of focus of the program, and also based on on what we learned from the first phase. Then Yeltsje and her team they took over um, since a few years in the in the third phase of the program, which takes this all a step further and um, actually aims to support the transformations to more inclusive and sustainable water practices. Now, I will, we, we talk, Yeltsin and myself, we will talk about two topics we thought are interesting. One is about changing uh, partnerships and the other topic where I will talk about uh, also a bit from a DBC, from a phase two perspective. And then Yeltsin will talk about um, uh, joint learning. Um, so changing partnerships, if you look at, uh, at, uh, at the development of the water development partnership since 2008, in the beginning, we focused mainly on more fixed formal partnerships with a selected group of long-term partners. Then um, since phase two, actually, we thought it's, it's good to also open up this and to have more, try to have more diverse partnerships um, and also more initiatives from the global south. And we did this through open calls for proposals. So the figures show some of the of the results. So on the left hand side, you see the origin of the project leaders in the in the phase two projects, and there you see that about twenty three out of the one hundred and eleven projects are led by um, by partners um, from the global south. Um, and in the in the third phase of the program, this is already uh, fifty percent. Um, in the middle, we also encouraged uh, more prominent roles for for uh, female researchers. So as you can see here, actually about half of the projects are led by um, female uh, researchers. Um, and I think it's quite the same in, 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 uh, in the third phase. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the diversity in project partners. Initially, in the first phase, there was a stronger focus on knowledge institutions. We we try to open up, and now you see that there is also um, a, a good engagement of, of partners from civil society, government, and also private sector. Um, and in the third phase, there is also a strong fo focus on engaging 
uh, more with social scientists as well eh, as part of these knowledge institutions. Well, then I come to um, the phase two failures to learn from. Um, it's always a bit difficult to talk about failures, but but we came up with, with I discussed it also with Alan and with the team, and we came up with a number of, of, of failures or areas to improve on. One is more at the project level, level identification and implementation of projects. Um, we, we understand that it's, these calls are competitive. So, I mean, a strong proposal has a higher chance and also a strong uh, written proposal has a higher chance of, of uh, selection than, than other proposals. And we also realize that, that can, this can lead to inequities in funding possibilities. At the beginning, we, we had uh, kind of a writing workshop to, to, to address this. But actually, to be honest, then later on in the program, we, we have not paid enough attention to this, I think. And, and I think it's a very important point. The other point is inter and transdisciplinarity, which we also try to encourage uh, very much. I think we were quite successful in this. But at the same time, you can also say that, yeah, the practice, we all know that the practice of inter-transdisciplinarity is, is, is not easy. So it would be great if we could learn from the phase two experiences. Also often mentioned by projects is the management load and uh, many partners also in the Global South not always have the support systems uh, in place. A second part, a second aspect is the learning between projects. And here's also some two qu quotes from um, the reports of the projects that we got from projects. Um, in the beginning, we, we, we try to pay quite some attention to learning between projects. But, but we also have to be um, honest because it, from a program perspective, it takes time. We, we also did not have all the capacity. COVID also played an important role, the COVID pandemic. So actually in the end, looking back, I think that we could have done much more in, in sharing experiences and insights and, and, and knowledge between the projects. Also beyond, I think is very important. If I look back, then I think that we could have done more um, and by involving um, other organizations, uh, embassies, uh, local governments, uh, international donors, um, but also related programs. We did that, but but I think to make the program stronger and more impactful, um, there is room for improvement. The third point is the involvement um, in the future of the projects. That's something that comes back once in a while, also in the reports of the projects. It's an important point, I think, um, it also relates to the fact that we are more project-based now through these calls. Um, question is also a bit, is the responsibility of the program, is the responsibility of the projects? I think it's a joint responsibility. I think at the program level, we could do more to connect people and to organize sessions to discuss how can you indeed maintain interest and sustainability after project completion. So to discuss it amongst the projects and to learn from that. Um, this joint learning actually relates also to um, the presentation of Yelche. So I, I, I hand over to Yelche. <clears throat> okay, thanks uh, very much, Wim. Uh, indeed, uh, based on the experience uh, during phase two, we have embedded the joint learning from the beginning very strongly in the objectives and the structure of phase three of the program. This to avoid fragmentation and isolation by encouraging knowledge sharing between the projects, uh, amongst others by organizing regularly thematic seminars that brings together the different project teams, but also to facilitate interactions and joint learning between them. Um, this Explicit, I think you can uh, press the next button. Uh, that uh, Yeah, thank you, Wim. This explicit uh, emphasis on learning is also driven by the stronger need to acknowledge that water problems are inherently complex, multifaceted, and context specific. Often the problem itself is not fully known or perhaps not even knowable, and for whom this is actually a problem or according to whom. Therefore, creating solutions hinges on in-depth analysis and experimentation, this learning from what works and what doesn't work, the failures. This also goes hand in hand with acknowledging that we here at IHC do not possess all knowledge on water to be able to strengthen capacities elsewhere, but that actually we have a lot to learn uh, here at IHC from our partners and this also focus more strongly on our own capacity. It forces us to position ourselves more explicitly 
because uh, the way we understand problems and there's also the solutions we propose is shaped by our own perspective, experiences and understandings of life. Which diagnosis of a problem and which solutions therefore are proposed are favored uh, or are favored depends on power, interest and of course political context, as well as broader views on how we understand uh, what development is. Realizing this, we find it important as program to embrace different ways to understand, approach and solve problems as eventually this will lead to more meaningful, fair and sustainable outcomes. To generally embrace this diversity, uh, we need to redress colonial legacies and actively create space for underrepresented groups and voices in the water sector, such as women, people of color and lower economic classes and castes. Ultimately, this means that we need to be modest in what we can achieve and nurture humbleness in our attempts to make impacts with our projects and programs. This is a point that was also raised yesterday in the presentation by Elizabeth from IGREC in the session on sustainability. Next slide, please, Wim. Yes. Um, this new approach of foregrounding joint learning, however, also has its own pitfalls and things we are still struggling with. For instance, the paradox that learning is a privilege for those who do not face immediate needs. Yet learning is also needed for more meaningful and lasting impact. So how to balance the learning with producing concrete outputs and outcomes, making perhaps small incremental yet tangible impacts for those most in need. Another issue is that we as water professionals often feel very vulnerable to acknowledge that we do not know everything, that we do not have answers or solutions for, sp for specific problems. As program, we try to create safe spaces to open up and reflect on what we do not yet know or what does not go well. But we notice that not everyone feels comfortable to talk about this, especially not with us as program management, uh, because, of course, we also decide on how funding is allocated. Moreover, learning and reflecting needs another pace and mindset, which is often difficult to achieve in our busy lives. So how to slow down? Just reserving budget for joint learning in projects and organizing seminars to stimulate learning is perhaps not enough. We also experience that genuine inter- and transdisciplinary learning remains challenging how to value and include different wisdoms, perspectives, and approaches. For sure, academic and disciplinary jargon is not very helpful in this process, as it limits interactions with others and might reinforce hierarchies between scientific knowledge and other forms of knowing, instead of bringing those closer together. So how to develop the common language in which all team members can, team members can share their insight and contribute to the conversations equally? Also, as program management, we struggle with this and academic jargon regularly slips into our communication. I hear my time is finished, but I, uh, I'm going to uh, ask for a little bit more time to end um, because I have two more uh, issues that we're also struggling with. So another important issue um, as a program is how to deal with the persistent discriminative hierarchies in society in relation to gender, race and other forms of social differentiation. We managed to have very talented people of color and women in lead positions of our projects um, by, amongst others, setting very strict budget criteria. Yet we know that this is not enough. Several of these project leaders still experience intolerance, raising, ranging from in, inappropriate jokes to actively undermining their position. So how can we as a program management support them better? How can we protect them? against such behaviors? Or how can we nurture inclusive working cultures and strengthen allyship to jointly address such injustices? And last, we are still trying to make the monitoring of our program and projects more meaningful for stimulating learning. Like many development aid programs, monitoring and evaluation is mainly done based on numerical indicators and tangible outputs. Yet this, this only captures part of the process and the progress made and, and offers very little space for reflection and appreciating processes of learning. 
we try to capture stories of change that allow for more depth, more nuance, more subtle changes. These stories foreground processes of learning and reflecting on impact pathways. Yet identifying these stories and documenting them is not an easy, straightforward task. And in our rush to meet our own reporting deadlines, we tend to fall back on those numerical indicators and outputs set for the program. So even though we feel we are moving in the right di direction, it does not go without constant adjustment, without constant reflection and learning on our side, especially from what did not work out as we had hoped. So some of the issues that uh, Wim and I uh, mentioned uh, have already been mentioned in the previous sessions of this symposium, uh, and we continue to uh, uh, this, look forward to continue to discuss this with you uh, in this session, but also, of course, beyond. Thank you very much. Back to Margeet. Thank you, uh, Yeltsin and Wim. It's, uh, it's fascinating to get an insight glimpse into the two phases of the Water Development Partnership Program. I'm, I'm also curious to, to know a bit more how the two of you look at each other. Uh, so, Jeltje, did the improvements or the changes that you, you made to the program to have when taking over from WIM, was that in, re in response to some of the failures that WIM identified? Yeah, I think, I mean, um, I have learned a lot from Wim, uh, and I'm still learning a lot from Wim, actually, um, from his view on, on the program and from his experiences. Um, uh, so indeed, some of the things that we uh, decided to take forward in, the, in this new third phase, uh, joint learning, for instance, but also indeed further diversifying the, the partnerships, including more social sciences and more NGOs and civil support, uh, civil uh, society organizations, comes from also reflections we did together with Wim and, and from the lessons that they have learned in the evaluations they have done. And I think Wim and I look quite differently at the program, but therefore I think it's also very nice that we have the, the phases run in parallel because we I think uh, on both sides, there are things to improve and things to learn from. So I think it's actually a very nice collaboration and, and, and a very nice to, yeah, to jointly do this. So I also feel it's our joint program and I don't think so much in phases, but more like how we together try to move forward. So the joining is not, the learning is not just joint, but it's also, how can I say this? It's, it also incre it's also incremental. It happens through time. Yeah. So, Wim, anything you would like to uh, add to that? No, I I, I agree. I think it's um, we we have regular sessions and we discuss things and we have our uh, own focus indeed and on 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 the program. But I think the the eighty percent you know is 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 similar. So the the basic idea of Working in partnership and in global south and with partners and looking at 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 local demand user centered activities, trying to 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 facilitate impact, and 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 also adjusting the program to address the needs, which is sometimes indeed very challenging. Those are things that that we have been discussing indeed. And I remember at the beginning, the start of the writing of phase three proposal, you know, we had a nice ses session together also with the team members to to indeed look at, you know, what were the what were the successes, but also the the, the failures, you know, or, or things for improvement. So so I think indeed that's a very nice collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. There's I see in the I've I've read the all the questions in the Q and A. Uh, most of them are questions I think we will get back to after all the presentations, but I can already see that they will revolve around two themes. One is how to how to best monitor joint learning or whether joint learning is happening or not and how to report on this, the question that uh, Yeltsin also raised. And the other question that I see emerging from the Q&A the Q &A, is the question around how to navigate the intrinsic structural inequalities that continue to, to be there and that are, that are also intrinsic to the very water development and partnership program with the funding coming from uh, a particular Dutch place. And um, so in a way, the direction of the funding seems is, is working against the desire to give more uh more space for for 
others to steer the direction and nature of the project? These are, I think, two important questions that I already see are popping up in the Q&A. So let's keep these in the back of our mind. We, we will get back to those after the following presentations. Um, and let's move on to, to the next presentation, a presentation I'm really looking forward to. It, the, present, the presentation is about projects in water resource development projects in post-war Iraq by Nadia Pausi, who works at the Marine Science Center at the University of Basra in Iraq. And Nadia's research interests have been in the Iraqi marshes and and Shat al-Arab, the coastal area of the northern Arabian, Arabian Gulf, and the vulnerability of the already stressed environment to climate change, water shortage impacts on this environment, and their effects on the region's indigenous people, the so-called Marsh Arabs. Nadia, the floor, floor is all yours. Are you there? I don't see Nadia. Ah, yeah, there you are. Yes, hi, <laughs> hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the interesting sessions. Um, talking about failure is really challenging. And uh, once I talked to Yeltsi and said, everyone is afraid of saying that we failed uh, a project, uh, but I think we need actually very important. I feel that we need to discuss it. Um, I will tell you my story and why coming from a personal experience, as you said, I work in Iraq and I worked uh, pre and post war situations in Iraq. And I saw this happening and I always tried to emphasize how to move the project forward and leave a legacy, a positive legacy. This is most of the time, I'm sorry to say that is not happening. So let's start with, with my story. So, um, oh. I don't know why, okay. So as you said, I am from Iraq and I'm focusing my work on this area of the marshes of Southern Iraq. Uh, you may know, or may not, many of you might not know that Iraq depends on two rivers that are mainly coming from outside Iraq, mostly from Turkey and some from Iran. And those rivers uh, flow through Iraq from north to south for millennia. And before the 70s and 60s of the last century, Iraq was faced with flooding from challenge, the challenge, the main challenge for those two rivers were the floodings that happened through the spring season. After uh, or early 70s, the water started to get less and less that entering those two rivers. The rivers started to dry because of the, um, you know, blocking of the water up in the north because of the dams, in mostly in Turkey, and then of course in Syria. Adding up to that is the changing of the climate, so reducing of the rain and the snowfall up in the north of the country that reduced the flow of the water. So the Ira Iraq started to face a longer period of droughts, less rain, of course, and the, the marsh area, which is here in the south of Iraq, started to dry up. The other challenge that faced this area also, adding up to the reduced amount of water, is the war in the 80s between Iraq and Iran. That has impacted the, the marsh, the whole marsh area, because the government started to dry this land as you see, it's on the border of Iran here. So they dry this land to have access, you know, to ease up the war situation. And that started the diverting of water coming to the rivers and the drying up of the land. Adding up to that is the exploration of oil. This area is rich, very rich in oil. And the drying is happening also. So every 
think work against this environment, the climate change, the war, the drying of the this area. So this situation, if you see Iraq, this is the marshes before the 70s and during the early 70s. It's a green lush with lots of water. However, and this is the women participating actively in the life of the marshes. While after the 80s, when the Iraq-Iran uh, war, which uh, continued for eight years, this is after the drying, adding up to the first and second Gulf Wars, uh, after the invasion of Kuwait, and the climate change, diversion of water reduced from the uh, north, that is the situation in the marshes now and continue to get worse and worse. The drought period is getting longer and longer. Temperature is really high, so evaporation is very, very high. So as you see, almost a dry, almost a dry land. So this is the situation now. Now, after 2003, 2003 in Iraq life is a turning point because of the changing of the previous regime to a new regime, uh, supposed to be a democratic elected government. And the international community started to heavily uh, participate in the development because for more than 30 years, Iraq was cut off the world, no development, completely embargoed, and the infrastructure is completely destroyed because of the first and second Gulf Wars. International organizations started to uh, come to Iraq uh, to fund the project. And specifically, I'm going to talk about my experience working on a project uh, to revive the marshes, as well as providing water for the people who try to come back to this dry land. So to encourage them to come back, they, the government and the international organizations and the funders, different countries, uh, most millions were put into projects uh, through UN and through US, uh, European, uh, Japan, you know, most of Uh, Nadia, you're you're suddenly muted. Can you unmute yourself? Oh. Yes. No. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So most of these projects, Nadia, came... Nadia, yeah. Can you reshare your presentation? We lost your presentation. Oh, I think you no. you disconnected for a few minutes for a few seconds. Okay, I'll try to do that again. Sorry about that. I can find one. If we need to do it, let us know. Okay, I'm trying to share again. Do you see it now? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, can you please uh, do it? Because it seems that I can't do it yeah. from here. I don't I know. Will. I think it's the net. internet is very... I will Slow ask my uh, colleague Ain to share your Right, I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. No problem. This happens. So have a little patience uh, with us to all. So Nadia, your presentation is coming up. Uh, Ain is uh, searching for it now and uh, ready to share her screen. There it goes. Okay. Oh, so you okay. have, you can. Uh... Okay. More. Next slide. Next, please. And next. Okay. So, yeah. So, please. Uh, no, no. Go back one slide. Okay. So, uh, 
I will leave all the project and focus on one example that bringing technology to, to this area, suddenly introducing it without uh, prior knowledge, without support, and spending all this fund on a project, uh, it seems really disappointing and disappointing to the people specifically. So as you see here, we see the, uh, you know, trying to uh, extract water from a, a river, a very small riverine close to this uh, solar system and clean it and then distribute it to the neighbor area. All right. And uh, this kind of solar system distributed in different places around a you know, relatively small area, not the whole uh, Mars area, but the relatively small area. And people were very you know, uh, excited about seeing this something new to them. And they received, they started to receive water from that. Can we go to the second slide, please? And to the second, yeah. Yeah, the issue is after I'm getting short, so we can, you know, just finish as possible. Um, after uh, the uh, organization that provided this system, of course, the funding finished and the project had to, you know, to, to finish also. So they left, but the project stayed as it is without a support, no maintenance, no operation, uh, people who are operating and no commitment from the government itself to maintain this project. And the people, what happened? The people couldn't use it. It's a standing there, but they couldn't use it. So they are going back to buy water normally. So can we go to the last slide, please? Last, yeah, thank you. So what went wrong with this just one example and compare it to the wider number, a huge number of uh, funded projects that happens in this area? Mostly that the uh, project goal wasn't really fully implemented and the stakeholders, especially the people from around the area, were not involved. They were not uh, you know, brought to the discussions about their needs, how how to implement what they need also. And also the, the discussion with the government should have taken place before the completion of the project. So the project should be handed to the government or to local government and have a commitment from them to continue the operation of the of these systems. So I will refer you to yesterday's uh, Peter and Alan and today's Yelchi's also discussion that how to uh, maintain such a project that have been spent a lot of money into putting such a project, but it seems that they are just not working. So this is my just one example of the idea that it's such a wonderful project that's supposed to, you know, be successful is just just stop and it's just look like a monument in the middle of this dry area. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Nadia, for a uh, for a fascinating presentation, and. Uh, Adding to your conclusion, it also seems that your your experience of these projects it's also it also shows that sometimes projects are just too small and too powerless to really change the larger processes that are happening, right? Because in this area, as you presented, there is upstream dams, there is it's a post-war area. There is climate change and there is the exploration of oil. And of course, a small project that aims to supply a bit of water can do very little to transform these larger processes, which is in itself uh, a huge challenge and something that is also about, it, it, it also questions what projects can do and how to think about impact. So thanks a Thank lot. You. 
I don't know whether there are smaller questions that that people asked in the. Uh, I didn't look actually. Yeah, I think there's one smaller question. Do you think that the economic situation of local communities is more important than other factors? I don't know whether that's maybe that's a big question, <laughs> but or it's a small. I mean, you, it's you not a small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The the issue I think with the economic situation, those people used to be so independent and rich by the richness of the surrounding environment. They were almost independent. They had their uh, fish from the water, you know, from the marshes itself. They had the buffaloes. They sell fish in the market. They sell their produce from the buffaloes and the handicraft that I show in the in the uh, you know in one of the slides. But since the dryness of the area, all of this is lost. So they came so dependent on handouts from the government, from uh, you know uh, local NGOs and international NGOs, and this dependency. Uh, made them hopeless, I felt. And the issue that international organization came with the prior decision of what they do, how do they help them, they didn't ask them enough. They didn't give them enough chance to uh, to to talk about their needs and how they these needs are satisfied. So this is one of the issues that I feel that we need to discuss more. International organizations come with experience from all over the world, but everything is specific to specific places. I had a discussion with the UN people. They come from Africa. The, the experience that they have in Africa is different because of the different culture in, in this in Middle East in general, and this area specifically. We are, as people from Iraq, feel that it is different culture for us to understand it is hard enough for a person to come from outside. So as all rightly you said, we need longer time, but also one of the things that actually I need to highlight, following up programs. You know, you spend lots of money in three, four years, millions of dollars spent in a project that is have a timeline. After that, everything is finished. You pack, I mean, the donor is, or, you know, the funder pack and go. Leave it to people there and to the government. And I saw with all my work that most of these projects just disappear, disintegrate. And this is a pity, it's it's painful to watch all this effort just go like that. Thank you, Nania. It's a it's a very depressing message, actually. And it's also <laughs> Sorry not, about that. No, but it's a real it's, message. It needs to be told, and it's but of course it's also not a very unusual message. And I think let's uh, it's something all of us are part of. We are part of these dynamics, even though we try to change them. So I think we need to really, it's a, a very important to think about this. And I think you have, you already point to some directions of doing things differently, work with local communities, embed projects in existing government institutions and, uh, uh, and organizations. But I think there's much more to say about it. And I want to create a small, uh, uh, how do I say it? A small sign to paste on my wall with your formulation of everything specific is specific in specific places. I think that is also a, a very valuable lesson that we all need to take to heart. Uh, I'm so sure much. I'm sure you your presentation has raised many more questions that we will try to address after the next presentations. So thanks a lot, uh, Nadia, a virtual applause for you. It was a, it was very uh, interesting and uh, instructive to listen to you. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Adel Yassin from the Palestinian Water Authority. Um, Adele is the director of wastewater planning 
at the Department of the Palestinian Water Authority and the project lead of Master Plan Wadi Zomer. Adele, uh, first of all, uh, I cannot introduce you without saying something about how all of us feel deeply and are deeply concerned about what is happening in Palestine. And I'm, I, have, I have a lot of respect for, for you being here and in spite of everything that's going on, having agreed to give this presentation, I'm sure we will listen with extra attentiveness because of it. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Margaret. Again, uh, thank you for inviting me to present uh, uh, our project that is funded uh, through the UBCA3. It is a joint project that between uh, some local partners and the IET from the Netherlands. So I will start uh, sharing uh, my screen in case uh, the internet is disconnected or something happened. Peter Van de Steen is with you. He can also uh, back up me so that uh, no risk that uh, my presentation will be like uh, not uh, completed. So I will start uh, showing my, uh, my uh, screen. Yeah, uh, our project is uh, mainly tackling uh, industrial wastewater uh, in a stream uh, that is transboundary between the Palestine and Israeli. Uh, and it is, uh, it is from the uh, title of this project, we can, you can see that it is the main objective of this project is, is uh, like to make a, a master plan. Uh, so that uh, the overall vision of uh, our uh, uh, project is to make a inclusive master plan for industrial wastewater management, which is not heavy industries. It is limited with uh, three to four type of industries, mainly olive waste, which is almost seasonal uh, pollution, uh, slaughterhouses, and also st stone cuttings. This is the main three harmful industries that it is almost like uh, produce the, 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 to make the wastewater quality is almost either uh, str uh, we, uh, medium to strong. So it is not a normal domestic uh, wastewater. While the overall objective of our project, which is a second phase from a previous phase that we did a management plan is to protect shared water transboundary water resources between the Palestinian and the Israelis. In our study uh, area, the Western aquifer is the, the biggest shared transboundary aquifer between the Palestinian and the Israeli, and it is mainly used for uh, domestic purposes. So that the, the aquifer is very important for both sides and protection of this uh, aquifer from the in industrial wastewater pollution from from the Palestinian side to the Israeli side, or sometimes from the settlements that is located in the study area. So this is very important uh, to do that, and also building the trust. And as uh, Margaret said, now we are now living in a war between the Israeli and the Palestinian. It is mainly now in Gaza, but. There is an uh, effect on, uh, on, on, the, on the remaining Palestinian territories, either in, uh, in Jerusalem or in West Bank, so that all the Palestinian now is fear as are now under effect of the war that is started uh, on uh, October 7 until now is, is continuous. We hope this war should stop soon because it is now 40 days from starting, and we hope this will be end and we keep again the negotiation for the two state solutions that always we hope that at the end we got our uh, like our uh, state uh, independent and according, and according to the uh, UN resolutions uh, 242338 now uh, our output from our project is normal is normal it is also database publication capacity strengthening training public awareness, advocacy, workshop, but the most important for, uh, output from this project is the master plan for Wadi Zomar. And why this is very important, in addition to the objective, as I mentioned, that, that we need, we need to involve all the various stakeholders 
either governmental or non-government in the in the in the decision making in 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 contribute to the vision that we started from November 2021 and we did a big workshop in March 2022 and and the main objective of our master plan is to utilize the waste and to train it to a source because all our sampling analysis or our uh, survey showed that there is no harmful uh, wastewater in that area so that we can we can after the treatment use it in different um, purposes like agriculture or industrial so that our main uh, main one of the main objectives of the master plan to utilize these non-conventional source in other uh, in other uh, 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 industries and to make the clean production from the uh, source mainly from the slaughterhouses, from the olive waste, or from the stone cuttings. All these waste could be transferred to uh, to uh, a source, uh, like it to be used in industry or like clean production. This is very important. Uh, here is a schematic diagram. We could read it from uh, right to left because up to here, up to here, it is the border between the, Israel, the Palestinian and the Israeli. So from the, the, the right, we can see the river, which is Wadi Zomar, which is our uh, case, case study. Here we see the Nablus treatment plant that produces around 5 million cubic meters of treated, highly treated effluent uh, tertiary treatment. And there is also a trunk line for untreated sewage for nine communities in the Palestinian side that that collected and it treated the Yad Hanna treatment plant that it is in the Israeli side. So we are three, we are uh, dealing with treated effluent of around five million cubic meter that is uh, passed in a, a open channel and during the through through the uh, the, the channel there is uh, some some pollution came from Anapta from another way so that it is reach the Israeli side, not as treated in, in the treatment plant in Nablus. So it is mixed with some pollution here and there, and many industries that is located along the wadi, either olive mills, stone cuttings, slaughterhouses, uh, tahina, etc. So that, so this is, this is, this pollution, yani, make, make like the, the treated effluent quality is deteriorated or like making uh, making worse than what was in the source in the treatment plan. And this is our ambitious timeline that we should make the what is so more clean. And what we are now doing now it is we are making the design for the treatment plant in Tulkarim, which is in near the border, it means that we should cut off all the influent, influent from the Palestinian side to the Israeli side. And also we are now in the evaluation process for the trunk line from Nablus, from Nablus treatment plant that is now in the Oban channel to the east direction. It means that we should also cut off all the treated effluent that passing through Wadi Zomar. So, we have two alternatives, either to convey the treated effluent from west to east to the Jordan River Valley. It means that all the pollution to the Israeli side will be cut off and then the, 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 uh, the uh, groundwater resources will be protected. Or also we have another uh, alternative that to make a convey a, a, a pipeline from Nablus West to the Israeli border that will collect all the treated effluent and will be protected from here or there uh, pollution that come from uh, scattered industries or uh, un raw sea which came from tankers or from other uh, uh, pollution sources. All these were studied in the in the first phase that we published a report about what is the source of pollution, what is the a possible intervention that we could do to protect the groundwater resources and to keep the trust between the both uh, sides. 
Here is, is, is just an example about what we are doing in the, in the sampling in the Palestinian side. And we have four locations, and then also in the Israeli side, there is also a, a, a sampling carried out by the Minister of Environment and the Natural Resources that we always, we use like to share these data uh, at the first phase. And we try like to make like, uh, to, 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 to see what is that, joint intervention that we can do to protect the groundwater resources along Wadi Zomar and to keep it by natural storm water and runoff of, of rainfall rather than to keep it uh, with the raw sewage, uh, raw sewage either in the open channel in Wadi Zomar or in the, in the trunk line. Here is just a schematic diagram or outline about what we are doing in our project about how like we can I mean, achieve our objectives. And here you see the seed some indicators and monitoring that we are doing. We, we, we in at the beginning, we identified similar indicators that we should buy into of our project to achieve and to I mean, our ambitious goal to make what is Zomar clean from the raw sewage or even to protect the treated effluent from being polluted again by by scattered industries or or uh, raw sewage siptage from tankers. Adele, um, since, Adele yes, uh, uh, you're reaching almost the the end of the time for your presentation. I don't know. Only one slide. One oh, slide. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is the challenges now. The, and we are not under risk of failure, so that we still uh, still uh, in the uh, in that track. Only what happened in October and November this year affected our plans because the most important things to make sa wastewater samples in October and November because of the season of of uh, olives that make the quality of uh, wastewater almost uh, strong. That because mixing the Z-bar or mixing the olive waste in the in the open channel make you know, the quality uh, bad, you know, bad and almost uh, almost like uh, not normal. So what, what, what was the effect of the, the current situation in Palestine, which is uh, usually the word that we didn't consider in our uh, like in our uh, proposal, we always used to have some class, uh, clashes here or there and some like aggression here or there, but we didn't like expect that the war will take for 40 days or we don't know which will, will end up. So our, uh, the, 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 what could be affected is the locations of the, our sampling is exactly on the border. And now it is not accessible because it is now a military zone so that also, uh, also uh, for like due to the overall situation and and the closure imposed by the Israeli army, that the uh, the environmental inspectors and the police, everyone they are not able to control the pollution from like industries, and and also the 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 the, the trust between the professionals in both sides, the technical level may be affected because of the overall situation on the high level, like in the. Politica, the, the geopolitics, uh, uh, the geopolitics situation. So our project is still safe. Our plans will be now uh, to, uh, like adopted because we missed the most important uh, season, which is the olive season, that is mainly in October and November. So we will try like to uh, to, to to adapt our uh, our uh, project activities and maybe. We, can, we we will ask for extension of uh, years because we uh, we uh, plan to have a three conse consequence uh, three sequence uh, years 2023 2024 and 25 that to have data for three years now we missed 2023 and maybe we like we uh, we uh, should uh, go uh, go uh, to uh, to extension of uh, a year if we like found there is no other possible way to collect the data. So this is our my presentation. Uh, I am ready for any uh, question. Uh, question and uh, apologize for being like late for maybe a minute or two minutes. But no, we are now on the time. Thank You're you, Akin. Thank you so much, Adele. And once again, thank you for 
for also taking the time for presenting in, in this seminar, given very difficult circumstances that you also refer to. Um, I Everybody who has a question can put it in the Q&A. I have looked at the questions that are in the Q&A. There you can also raise your hand and that makes it perhaps more lively. So please go ahead and do that. And I, yes. um, I just wanted to say, seeing yes. uh, the time and the interest in the session, yes. uh, if it is all right with all the panelists, we would like to propose that we can have the session for an extra half an hour, just so that we have more time for discussions. Okay. Um, how do is people... That how do people, uh, for me, it's fine. All right. Um, uh, the panelists, I don't know, Adele and Nadia, are you fine with it? And Wim and Yelche? Yeah, my fine. Yes, my fine. I'm fine with it. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay, great. That means that we have time. And to kick off the discussion, I'm struck actually by the parallels between the the presentation of Nadia and the pre presentation of Adele in the sense that you both present projects that happen in very difficult geopolitical circumstances. And for me, that raises the question how, how to deal with, how to relate to these different geopolitical circumstances with a relatively small project. The project as a project, you can never really change these larger geopolitical circumstances. Yet you can also not avoid or deny or ignore them. You have to navigate them. And what I find interesting is Adele, you show that I, as a critical social scientist, I have always I always make a plea for engineers to be explicit about their politics. I think if I hear you correctly, you say, hmm, perhaps in my situation, the opposite is, is much wiser. Eh? If, if as a project, we maintain a strictly technical, uh, uh, a, a strictly technical, uh, we, we claim to be strictly technical, that allows for collaboration as soon as we we uh, admit to being political, we are, we are gone. So I find that interesting. And it, it raises question about indeed what the panel is about, about impact. It, and, and the question is really about how projects navigate larger geopolitical context. In, in Iraq, it's the, the post-war war, uh, situation, but of course, the implications of the war are still being felt. Adele, you're in the midst of a war situation and projects are have to navigate that, how to do it, I think. And I think uh, uh, maybe Fishwanat Srikantaya, I don't know whether I pronounce your name right. You asked a slightly similar question. So maybe you want to, to ask that question if you are there. Fishwanat Srikantaya, are you there? Or maybe he's no longer here. Hi, uh, you can unmute yourself now. Oh, Fishwanath says not possible to ask. I can read his question and then you can maybe... Uh... Uh, Vishwanath, could you please raise your hand and then yes. You can now. But Fishwanath says in the chat that it's not possible to ask. I don't know why that is. No. Sorry. But the, uh, the question, the question Vishwanath asked in the Q and A is: most water interventions are ideological, political not technical, I would say ideological, political, as well as technical. How do we factor in democracy and agency in interventions when it disturbs the elitist status quo? I think that is an interesting question. I don't know whether you want to react to, react to that question, Nadia or Adele. 
Yep, I don't mind uh, shouting. <laughs> if you don't mind, I just. I think okay. it is the three. I uh, Iraq, by the way, is uh, still unstable after I don't know how many years uh, we are. You know, the situation is uh, still unstable. So, the difficulty for international organization is working in this unstable communities and stable environment. Sometimes it's risky, really risky environment. Is it so hard? Uh, but I would say, and it's not. Uh, I don't know how how much is small for you. I mean, uh, UN put millions. Uh, US put millions of dollars. Uh, Japan put millions, five million, six million for each project, and especially for the for the marshes itself. So, so, at the so you're, when say, you're saying, Nadia, actually, the project is not small. The project are the, enormous. No, and no they... this one specific. No, no, sorry. This one specifically wasn't that big. But in general, the amount of funding that put into the marshes to revive the marshes is huge. But from the beginning, since 2003, when they came to wanted to revive the whole area, ambitiously, we said as a local, could you hold on please and have deeper and more discussion about the whole situation? Because they gave, I felt, I don't know, at, at least me and some of my group, we say that we gave a false hope to people to come back. They came back and uh, with some water that we were lucky at that time that there was some water coming to the area and you know it was re-flooded and seems everything is wonderful. But we knew that we are going to face more difficulties in the future with Turkey and with the whole climate change situation. We could have read this from a long time. I mean, we noticed that. So we said, we need to look at a project that focus on a specific area of the marshes rather than say we fund So that is uh, that is the issue. All the UN and the larger, the bigger funders needed to to listen and to go deeper into classification of priorities and the issues that need to be addressed before going and putting one million into water, two million into resettlement. I don't know, five million into. Uh, reviving this part or putting a new project like you know what you say with the with the solar system. So if they combine all the effort together and work on a specific area that can be maintained, this is what we said. You need to look at area that you can maintain water for a, for a time, long time. A specific area rather than focusing wider on every part of the marshes. This is, didn't happen, and this is what we see now. The millions just disappeared. People come and go because they see there is water, and they come, and then no support, no sustainability of this area. So they leave again, and they are angry, angry and disappointed, and they just fed up of talking to people, really. Thank you, Nania, for, for clarifying and for, again, re-emphasizing the point, the importance of real engagement and eh? not just flying in and dumping money and and doing the replicating the same solutions that that are are done everywhere, but taking into account the the the, the specifics of the context and not just the specifics of the context and focusing but also taking into account and, and uh, the realizing how what is happening in the marshes is partly shaped by what is happening upstream with the dams in Turkey. Thank you very much, Nadia. Adele, do you also want to, to react yeah, to yes, this? Yes, I will answer your question about why we should, like the professional is still like uh, Kubaren to exchange uh, data and also like to, 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 to protect it from uh, pollution. The fact that the Israeli is deducting around 5 million euro every year from this stream to treat the wastewater from the Palestinian side, either treated from Nablus 
or raw sewage from uh, downstream with full term area. So in total, we are paying every year around 5 million euros. So we, we will not, we can't stop that because every time we are cleaning the wadi, we are, we are like uh, uh, treating our uh, waste, we are reducing the industrial waste. So that means that we are, we should minimize the deduction so that we are working with uh, different channels, mainly with the support from the Netherlands in the trilateral committee between the Palestinians and the Israeli that's supported by the Netherlands from the Hague. All the time we are, we are talking about how to reduce deduction, how to reduce pollutions, how to create a good environmental uh, environmental scheme to, 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 to reduce the pollution because it affects both sides. The aquifer is shared between both sides. The deduction is taken from the Israeli is like huge so that all the time we are trying to to minimize the, the, the pollution from uh, our uh, our side, not I mean, for like for free because we are interested to reduce the deduction from our taxes that is taken by the Israeli. Again, we have both mutual interest to keep this uh, aquifer clean, the, uh, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, catchment clean for the benefit of both sides and mainly for the Palestinian that we will try to reduce the, 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 the deductions because for every year from those deductions, we can build a project, okay? So that why to keep this every year is happening, deduction every year, every year, every year. And yani, maybe you are aware that now the Israeli will build from their side a treatment plan that's approved by the Knesset or the parliament with around 180 million shekel, which is equivalent to around 35 million dollar. 60% of them will be deducted from the Palestinian taxes held by the Israelis. So we are interested to have this mutual interest to clean up this wadi, to protect the groundwater resources from a side, and also to stop deduction from the other side. So we will keep we will keep doing all our efforts either from uh, our this our small project or because from our small project we highlighted for the decision makers and for the government that what is the importance of to have this intervention to making a treatment or to to improve the the quality of the uh, wastewater from our side because at the end we should we should reduce the deduction that is is very very uh, يعني, huge compared to the quality of the water so with with the small interventions with with like with, with uh, from our project we can we can uh, we can achieve our goals which is uh, protecting the aquifer and also reducing the deduction so this is why يعني, why يعني i will answer from andrew gomez question that why in I introduced a lot about our project? Because we should know that it is a transboundary project. There is conflict between both sides. It is not normal. In Liberian, Israelis, and Palestinians, we are under occupation. And it is, we are not like any other Liberian countries that there is a, a everyday cooperation or that. Because as you know that today we are in a war. All the time we are facing like... Um, uh, uh, a problem is here and there so that politically we are in and not in a stable area so that also the intervention is very important because we should keep our rights to stop the deduction from our money that's sold by the side so this is very important the project we are will continue that we will try to adapt our plans at least to at the end to submit a master plan for our leaders, for our decision makers that contain what intervention on the uh, short and medium term to do at least to achieve our goals from this uh, project. Again, thank for you do, do BC3 for, for funding this uh, project. And again, we are working now, now our team on the technical level 
we are working to collect data about everything. Only what we now facing is the how that we 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 like we like uh, make the samples and how we can like yeah. make the, the meetings uh, on like uh, that planned in November. But our project is still going. Yeah. Thank hope... you, uh, thank you, Adele. Okay. Thank you very much. It's very clear. That on the one hand, you can you cannot do. It's very clear. Everybody has an interest in key, in maintaining a clean aquifer and cleaning it up, both the Israeli and the Palestine side. It's also very clear that collaboration is needed, and it's very difficult in these in these war times. And it's and you also show or or explain that even doing the minimal technical work now is being becoming more complex because of the war. So thank you for for explaining all this. I I wanted to give a small opportunity to Yelche and Wim to just react as because and relate it back to perhaps to to their to their presentation. Yeah, um, yeah I'm uh, I'm uh, I realize like listening to these stories of Nadia and Adele, uh, and of course we are very aware of what is going on and we have more regular uh, interactions but it just emphasizes again and then i come in with an email can you please submit your progress report or why didn't you upload this output yet on the our repository you know and i realize the circumstances you are working under it's so amazing and we are trying to do things in such complex difficult circumstances that are changing every day and unfortunately in some places are getting worse and worse so it's also for us as a program, a very good reality check. Like, yes, of course we have things that we need to do and huh? we need to, to report and we have certain expectations. But in the end, it's about together really trying to think what makes sense in this particular place at this particular moment, what is needed here and how can we help this team to succeed or, or to do the things they, they want to do and they think are most needed. So um, yeah, I'm just, um, Thank you very much again for uh, sharing these stories um, because I, yeah, sometimes we also, of course, get um, lost in our own uh, objectives and our own um, time frame and our own deliverables that we need to do. Uh, um, so we need to continue this kind of conversations and have very close relations with the partners anywhere in all the areas where we work, but especially in the places where it is more challenging, uh, because together we need to find or we need to try to find pragmatic uh, ways to work around and to keep going and to stay connected and to build partnerships. And I can also imagine it creates tension in the project teams uh, with different views, different understandings of what is going on. And that's not always easy. Um, I just want to say we are here to think with you and to be pragmatic. Um, but thanks again for sharing, both of you, uh, your perspectives. It's very helpful for us. Thanks, uh, Yelchi. Wim, do you ha want to add anything or do we have your own thoughts, perhaps? No, I think it, it shows that it's um, for a program like this, it's it's um, it's really important to work with, with local partners. I mean, like what was presented by Nadia, you know, that, that we go there and have the solution and then you know that's really not the way we like to do it. so we work in partnership and it's about listening and and trying to understand what are the problems and what can we do at project level but also at program level what are the possibilities and um i think the other thing is in relation to yelche is that the program needs flexibility and i think we have flexibility and also in the second phase I think because there is there is more regions, you know, where there is instability and where we had projects uh, finding it difficult, you know, to continue operations as they as they had in mind, and then you know they 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 adjusted and somehow you know we managed to to keep the the, the partnership and the collaboration going, and in some cases not. And uh, an example maybe is also the COVID pandemic, um, you know, and and there also we tried at least to to um, interact with with projects to understand, you know, how can we still, given this very difficult situation that we had a few years ago, um, how can we still uh, try to continue our collaboration? So that's the flexibility a program like um, WDPP should should offer. And I think we do. So I also encourage you to, um, to, to, to come to us and to discuss these things. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yeltsje and uh, Wim. And I think Yes, uh, once again, thanks Nadia and Adele. We need we need these uh, 
radical, on, radically honest stories in a way. Yeah, we very much need them to to learn and and to and also to to forge the relations and connections. Because by opening up in this way, I feel now as if I know both of you, although I have never met you. And and I think that is also the the benefit of of a program like this and a symposium like this. That by opening up, we get to know each other, we we start to empathize, and we start understanding things from different perspectives. So thank you very much. I would now like to invite Muna to uh, <laughs> with the to do the difficult task of uh, mm -hmm. providing some kind of wrapping up of this session. So, uh, Muna, please go ahead. Thank you, Mahmoud, Jalsha, Wim, Adel, and Nadia, and uh, all those behind uh, putting together this symposium and this session. Uh, I'm really happy, delighted to be here. Um, and as I wanted to kind of bring another maybe radical and kind of uh, provocative uh, ideas and statement into what I've heard in this session, it is about sharing failures and how can we learn from it. Uh, but one thing that I, I kind of trying to wrap up uh, what I've seen in terms of also the content, but also the discussion that ensued around, you know, um, how do we assess our projects? How do we uh, how do we actually engage with this failure, understand it and try to kind of seek behind it? And I want to encourage everyone uh, to look at it um, um, in a very critical and provocative way of kind of uh, trying to understand kind of the hegemony, the epistemic hegemony behind the realities we under we are, we work under, you know, as we water researchers, practitioners, engineers, as project managers, and uh, as just said in the beginning, like learning becomes a privilege. Uh, the uh, the spaces we have today in these projects to carry out the work we do seems like it's hierarchic, hierarchical, um, um, and then we are coming together. We wanting to provide solutions to communities that seem to be or are characterized to be. Uh, lacking uh, solutions, you know, so this idea coming from that perspective requires a lot of work of unlearning that we don't always have the solution and we don't always uh, know everything like uh, just you were saying in the in your in your presentation. Um, and then kind of yeah like the, the both case studies are really fascinating because we're talking about cases of uh, belligerent type of um, material. Um, occupation, war, colonialism, settler colonialism. So we're talking about cases where we cannot really address water issues without really uh, exposing, acknowledging and addressing, you know, the underlying reasons behind why we are today, why we are in this situation today. Whether in terms of the failure of such projects and infrastructure to actually launch well and to be actually beneficial to the communities themselves. So we have kind of the the physical failure of these projects to actually achieve any uh, reality, like Nadia was mentioning about the marches, like we have what you have shown, Nadia, this really beautiful, intrinsic uh, and really deep uh, rooted connection of people to the marches. There's traditional knowledge, there's, there's a women led a role for a lot of these activities that used to take place in those marches. We have seen such first knowledge, traditional knowledge and learning that we can learn from. But however, we see that um, water uh, and water governance in that in the marches and in, in our region has always taken a very techno managerial approach. All of that wealth of knowledge, all of that, you know, richness has been completely ignored, sidelined. Uh, and what has been proposed has been very techno managerial approaches. Like how can we actually explain like make use and optimize the use of this really dying river, dying culture and heritage uh, by putting solar panels. And so, so the solution becomes the problem in a way. So I think these a lot of, this is facing, this is of course, as you mentioned Nadia, it's not um, uh, only regarding this project specifically, but it's the approach that is problematic. It's the approach that lack this insight into, you know, the richness and um, the the really uh, uh, the richness of the traditional knowledge that exists in our region that we need to capitalize on, we need to bring it back to life, and this is how we actually engage 
in our, our communities in a meaningful, forward-looking, long-term approach uh, that all our projects, uh, you know, at the end, they, this is what they want to achieve. We, we aim at joint learning and we aim at, you know, having, you know, positive impact on water governance, but also we aim to build that long-term, uh, uh, you know, uh, relationship. But these projects at the end uh, fail to do so, unfortunately, because the, uh, the objective has always been on the visual aspect, the, the big projects. Uh, this was also reflected by external factors, you know, like you mentioned Nadia and Adel as well. I'm going to come to Palestine in a bit. But the idea that also our uh, the government approach has, has also been techno-managerial, has also been about large scale infrastructure uh, that will address water issues and has always treated communities as victims at best, you know, that we can capitalize on to actually bring this money, bring these projects into, act, into, into uh, materialization. And also never really addressed communities as equal partners with really rich knowledge uh, and uh, uh, and expertise uh, that they can bring into the picture. So that has always been, you know, the big issue. We see it, and I would like to provoke it a bit with uh, Adel's intervention, me myself being a very critical uh, scholar around the issue of managerial apolitical approach, which in itself also shows a bit of um, epistemic somehow hegemony over how water should be addressed, how water issues should be addressed. So the idea that there is hierarchy between uh, how we intervene to solve a, a clearly technical issue. You know, we have wastewater streams uh, running through a very um, contested uh, place uh, that, um, um, but how do you do it? How do you, do you keep on talking about and, and, and exposing the underlying reasons behind these issues, or do you try to address it in political and sorry in techno managerial uh, approach? Like Adel is is actually showing us and um, explaining how this project is all about you know uh, reaching this objective of transboundary water uh, management. But I would like to actually talk about a lot of important political aspects that will make these projects will will never make these projects a success even if on a techno managerial level they've managed to do what they do because what's happening in palestine like of very similar to iraq is there's idea of cooperation is seen to be a very benign approach to addressing um, environmental water issues but at the end a lot of projects that are based on this line of thinking end up being dressing up domination uh, that is Israel is exercising over Palestinians as a sort of positive cooperation, uh, as a pro positive approach that will lead to some sort of peace building. Uh, and, and, and we've seen that this is not the case. You know, in Iraq and in Palestine, other places around the world, that we've seen how millions and billions of dollars have been spent on water projects that haven't really addressed the, the underlying issue, which is water injustice. What we see in Gaza today is a clear manifestation of failure of the international community with, uh, to, to address political realities. Gaza Strip shouldn't be under siege for 16 years. And those solutions that have been proposed by different international organizations in that strip of land, in that besieged strip of land, have been prescriptive, have been idea to kind of keep things afloat while the situation politically has been deteriorating very bad to the extent we see today. So if we see the infrastructure that Israel has destroyed, the water infrastructure was international projects like the WDPP and others that has been investing billions of dollars into those projects only to be obliterated, demolished by a very clear entity. So here we see like how these projects at the end of the day, if they, if they don't really work collaboratively and on equal th threshold with communities to build resilient system to address their underlying uh, conditions of water scarcity or water in inequal, inequal access to resources or whatever is the issue is. So there has to be always a very deep engagement with, with the communities we work with. And it cannot only be kind of bringing these uh, prescriptive type of approaches, but kind of really doing a very, very hard work of building trust and also making sure that we are uh, actually acknowledging the underlying causes, the colonial legacy and the current realities that uh, and external factors that affect this specific region, but also making sure that people come out with more resilient solutions rather than now Gaza situation is really dire because Gaza has no clear 
community-led uh, uh, and uh, you know regional focused uh, solutions to water uh, issues they, they are facing today because of the onslaught and the assault that's happening there. So we have to understand that water in itself definitely is a source for collaboration and cooperation and for joint learning and knowledge sharing, but it can also be a, a weaponized. Firstly, very much physically like we see today by, by, by occupation forces, but it can also be weaponized in our minds, thinking that water is only be to be solved by technical and techno-managerial approaches, never by coming back down to the river, down to the waterway, down to the, the sea that we are studying and really understanding its value, its meaning to the communities we work with. The legacies, the memories, uh, and the cultural heritage that they bring, that this water source brings to them the pride, the joy, you know? So I think this is um, partly to take a message to take from, from those places that seem to be so war-torn, seem to be in a desolate situation where we cannot get out, but there are also places where water is a very intrinsic aspect of life that we as, let's say, external uh, actors, as collaborators need to come with humble uh, hum humility and humbleness like Ma Mahrit was sp speaking about. Uh, and to ensure that we are actually working all together towards a more just world where water is actually centered around issues of justice rather than issues of uh, addressing uh, techno-managerial aspects. And I think I'll stop here, uh, but I, I really enjoyed uh, these sessions and the interventions of each and every one of you. Um, and I feel, yeah, there's a lot of room for thought. This is important. These are important conversations to have. Um, and failure does not even, uh, it's not in itself uh, negative, but it's actually meaning that there has been a lot of trials and the trials will get better and better um, as we do these projects and collaborate together. So thank you uh, all for your wisdom that you shared with us. Thank you, uh, Muna. I was, I was hoping that you would uh, uh, end the, and wrap up the session in this way. There's no better person to do that. So thank you very much and, and putting it very sharply and eloquently. I don't know, Ayn, would you want to close the session here or because I, I'm just uh, notified that there were some people waiting with their hands up that for some reason I could not see. So deep apologies for that. That was not my intention at all. Uh, I think I only see uh, some of the people on the screen. That's probably the reason. So I'm, uh, you're the technical moderator. So yeah. what would you like me to do? <laughs> um, we have one person with their hand raised still, Victor Ghana. Um, if you would still like very much to make a contribution, uh, we know that you have had your hand raised for a long time. So... Um, you are, I ask you to unmute if you would like to, but if you would like to also join our closing plenary, there would be still more space for uh, reflections from the audiences. Uh, I, I now see okay. that Peter van der Steen also has his hand raised. Peter, yeah. can you, you hear can... me? Yeah. Oh, there's first, Peter, shall we first have Victor and then give you a chance to say something yeah can you hear me now yes yes victor we can hear you yeah thank you very much and uh, thank you adele and uh, nadia i want to ask put this to nadia uh it's a good uh, project and um i would like to know what are the contributions of uh, the oil companies around the marshy areas. I don't know whether they, as part of their social uh, uh, responsibilities, you know, have contributed anything to water supply in that area because they are tapping from the economic resources of those areas and uh, they need to also contribute to the welfare of the people not just um, by uh, getting the resources they have there, but to also give them clean water to drink. Because I believe there will be pollution uh, through 
uh, those uh, uh, exploration and exploitation activities. Yeah. Can I and make uh, a, secondly, uh, sorry. thank you thank you Victor yeah. for your for your question I my proposal would be that Nadia answers the question in the Q&A because I did a, I did okay because it it slightly diverses from from the conversation we were have the, the the conversation we were having on the how the political and the technical are entangled or should be entangled or should be disentangled. And I'm sure that Peter wants to respond to that question. Uh, so Victor, if you don't mind, I don't, I, I'm not saying the question is not relevant because it's very relevant, but I think just to, to keep the energy of the conversation, I would like to give Peter the, the floor first. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Um... I, I listened uh, carefully to uh, Muna's uh, contribution, and 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 indeed, I think uh, I, I'm I'm also working uh, in the Wadi Zomar project uh, together with uh, Adol uh, as an external, as an IT staff member, um, and indeed the the approach that that Muna uh, suggested, I think we are indeed not uh, following in the project. Um, if I understood you correctly, you would like to put uh, justice in the center. And even though, at the one hand, I, I like that very much. I mean, uh, who, who could, who could uh, disagree with that? Huh? Uh, justice is probably the most important thing in the world. However, in, 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 in this project environment, that wouldn't work at all. Uh, in, in this project where uh, I, uh, I, I, can, I cannot speak for Adel, I only speak for myself. Uh, I, I work with both uh, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and, and we are trying to uh, step by step uh, improve the situation. And that I think um, uh, Margrethe mentioned that uh, uh, at the beginning of the session, personal relations uh, are very important there. So the, the, the personal relations between some of the uh, Israeli and Palestinian partners in the project, or, or not even partners, but stakeholders that are related somehow, are very good. And um, that can be a, a, a step, how to say, a, a, a stepping stone, slowly, slowly, maybe also later to improve um, uh, relations between their organizations. And then we build it up from the bottom, from the personal relations to the institutions, etc. If I would follow Muna's approach, and maybe I, 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 uh, I, I make it a bit stronger, maybe than you said, but if I put justice uh, uh, on, on number one, project is over. Both sides want to stop immediately. And then your result is zero. So that, that is, I think, why it would be better not to follow that approach. Uh, thank you, Peter, for raising that. And I think uh, it's actually the question that is perhaps at the heart of this whole conversation, because I was thinking when also when Nadia was presenting, I was thinking, oh, if if one engages in these technical projects, does it, do these technical projects by just focusing on the technical and by pretending to be just technical, do these projects not implicitly lend support to existing hierarchies and power asymmetries? And then, and then, because, but then the other side of the coin, of course, is is I think what I clearly understood from Adele, and what I now also understand from you, the only way, at least according to both of you, the only way to keep doing anything or to keep make to do any small step in Palestine is to to consciously almost pretend to be doing something that Muna calls techno-managerial. And of course, being fully aware that by doing something techno-managerial, techno claiming that it's just techno-managerial, I'm sure that both you, Adele and Peter, you're fully aware that it's deeply political what you're doing, but you decide to background the politics and to call it technical precisely be that is because that is the way that you can do something political. So it becomes it becomes very 
very difficult. And I think it's an interesting conversation. I don't know whether Muna want, or others perhaps still want to react, but I think this is, the, at least this is one of the questions that I think is at the heart of, of impact, eh? Be, tech, doing things technical and remaining seemingly neutral always seems easy, but sometimes it's also necessar necessary necessary if you want to do political or if you want, because I'm sure Peter, you want to, and Adele, you want to work on justice, but indeed, if you are open about it, you you may not even be able to do anything. So I see the dilemma. Um, is there anyone who wants to further react to this, to, to this or shall we just end with, with this question? And I think it will remain a question. And I, I, I still keep uh, Nadia's uh, motto in the back of my mind. Answering this question itself is always specific to the situation and to where we are. There's no general answer. Um, I'm at least left with, with a deep awareness of how important it is to openly and honestly discuss this. Uh, we don't often, often do this. We often have a tendency to either shy away from it because it's dangerous and it's sensitive or because we are not used to it. We are just used to discuss water and development in quantitative, easily monitorable terms. So thanks all the presenters. Thanks Muna for pu putting things in a sharp way. Thanks Peter for reacting. Thanks Nadia and Adele for very insightful and honest presentations. Thanks Yeltsin and Wim for doing the amazing job as as project coordinators, creating this safe space for people to, to engage with these questions. And uh, I think clearly we are only scratching the surface and only beginning the conversation. So I hope that we can have more of this in the future. Thank you, Maghreb. Thank you to all the speakers and especially to Muna for doing the difficult job of summarizing this discussion. Um, we will now take a short 10 minute break and we will come back for the closing plenary where we will hear from rapporteurs of all the previous sessions, a short recap of what happened and see what can be the way forward for the Water and Development Partnership Program. Uh, we won't close this session, so you can stick around, you can use the chat, you can still ask and answer questions and we see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> 